Friends, as we gather in spirit from far and wide, I invite you to join in this prayer of celebration and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless, whose steadfast love endures forever, we thank you for the presence of your spirit of love in our lives and with us today. We thank you for Atlantic School of Theology and the students, staff, and faculty who seek to follow your call to be faithful and effective leaders. We thank you, the source of all love, for the love and compassion and dedication shown by this community during the ordeal of a global pandemic. We thank you for your servants, the graduates of Atlantic School of Theology class of 2020 and class of 2021. We celebrate their commitment to learning. We celebrate their contribution to this community. We celebrate your work in their lives and their dedication to your call. Bless them with open and giving hearts for those they will encounter. Bless them with resilience for the challenges ahead and with the courage to work for justice. Bless them with joy at the delights in their lives and with gratitude for the friends and family who support them. Bless them as they have blessed us. Amen. This convocation ceremony is celebrating the AST class of 2020 and the class of 2021. We have centered the service in our St. Columba Chapel which is of such an important place for so many of us. Let us begin by our territorial acknowledgement. We begin by acknowledging our presence today in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. 
which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. As we begin this convocation celebration, I share with you the peace of Christ, and on behalf of the Board of Directors, say congratulations, and thank you for taking the low dress traveled. You are our inspiration. Reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint, nor does he grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the youths will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Israel shout, but God is always merciful. Let the family of Aaron, the priest, shout, God is always merciful. Let every true worshiper of the Lord shout, God is I am reading from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 to 9. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you in the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By God you were called into fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. reading from John chapter 15 verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments 
and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Please join me in our prayers of community. Let us pray. Holy God, we gather together today in your presence to celebrate the graduates of the Atlantic School of Theology classes of 2020 and 2021. We are most thankful today for your presence among us, a presence that has been stirring in each of us since our creation, a presence that in many different ways inspired, led, and called each of us to study and serve and give our very lives to understanding you better, to inviting you more deeply into our hearts and into our relationships, and to living out the call that you have for each of us. For this presence in our lives, God, we are most grateful. We are grateful too for this school we love, the Atlantic School of Theology. Today we remember with thanks each of the people who have given their time and energy and love to creating and sustaining and evolving AST for so many years. We give thanks for the board of AST, for its founding denominations, for our president and administrative staff, for our dean and all faculty at AST, for support staff and volunteers, for students and guests, for all those current and those who've served this school in the past. Continue, God, to bless this school with the dedication and hard work of people committed to the teaching and learning that this school has to offer. We pray today for our graduating class. May we find meaningful ways to turn what we've learned here at AST into service of your creation. We, may we be continuously open to receiving wisdom from many sources while also thinking for ourselves. May the foundation of learning we take from this place enable us to courageously speak truth and bring a voice of insight where it is needed. God, we pray for our families and friends, for all those who supported and encouraged us on this journey, for all the ways they sacrificed to help us get to this day. God, you created this beautiful world for us to share. And as we leave this place, may we prioritize care for our planet, compassion for one another, peace and justice in all hearts and homes and communities, abundance for those who lack what they need, reconciliation where relationships are broken, and healing for all who suffer. When we go from here today, may we go filled with purpose, 
seeking to make real the world you desire for us. May we live in a way that promotes fullness of life for all people. May we act with more kindness, have more patience with one another, and be very quick to celebrate the joy in our lives. May we go with courage to try new ideas, and if we prove ourselves wrong, may we have the grace to admit it and try again. May we dream together, pray together, and work together to build one world of peace and justice for all. And all the people said, Amen. Archbishop Emeritus Anthony Mancini, born in Italy, began his life in Canada at Pier 21 at the tender age of three. He was raised in Montreal and educated in Waterloo, Montreal, and Geneva, Switzerland. He was first installed as Archbishop of Halifax in 2007, then in 2011 as Archbishop of Halifax Yarmouth, where he served faithfully and often courageously until his recent retirement in November of 2020. Bishop Mancini has indeed demonstrated courage, tenacity, and vision during his tenure in Nova Scotia, beginning with one of his first homilies where the theme, I have a dream, was indelibly imprinted in the speaker's mind and heart. He steadfastly moved forward from there in reorganizing parishes, and in encouraging and empowering collaborative leadership structures. Bishop Mancini has been keenly interested in, engaged with, and supportive of AST. His lifelong commitment to ecumenism made him particularly well-suited to continuing the legacy of the late Archbishop James Hayes, co-founder of AST by recommitting to an ongoing relationship with this university in 2018. Another example of this is the inclusion of the diploma in the new evangelization as a key component of EQUIP, the Archdiocese Program for Lay Leadership Development. Bishop Mancini has consistently encouraged and upheld the ecumenical character of AST the continuing involvement of the Roman Catholic Church is a distinctive and valued attribute of the university. Bishop Mancini attended, hosted, and fully participated in the twice yearly meetings 
of the AST founding parties. For well over a decade of committed support of Atlantic School of Theology and for advancing our ecumenical drive towards Christian unity, Archbishop Emeritus Anthony Mancini is worthy of recognition as an associate of Atlantic School of Theology. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to shrink this down to three points, all of them under the umbrella of care, compassion, and laughter. It was always nice to hear Nancy's laugh down the hall, and sometimes even after traveling over an hour on the bus to get to work, and she'd do the same thing going home. Rain, shine, snow, hurricane, all of it. Sometimes I think she had two layers of clothing on under, over, under her winter coat, with a backup of hats and mitts and scarves. As she undid all those layers, there would be stories of her bus travels and her bus friends. Care and diligence to her work. Nancy was an old school kind of record keeping kind of gal. She had written daily log, but precision I would say that office has not seen since yet. When I first started at AST and was in a land of confusion, Nancy was so helpful to me. She would, she would say, you should be billing me for the following things, Brenda, quarterly fees and annual fees and salary fees and um, a bunch of other things. And she encouraged best practices. Get on the email list for AS, eh. get on the email list for regular CRA updates and read them, Brenda. In her honor, I have tried to do the same with pe people in her former role as they have changed and changed. In my head, I've said more than once, what would Nancy do? Willing to step in and lend a hand since her retirement, and at a bit of a loss when such precise record keeping could not be found the way she had kept them, she would say, where is her daily log? And I would say, um, maybe on the computer, Nancy. I think on the computer somewhere. And she would try to find it. She had such care and compassion for AST students. In her work and conversations with students, Nancy always made mental notes of those she felt might need a little extra help, financially or emotionally. Often, there would be reciprocal conversation and hints of ideas to AST management on student support where she knew it could be found. When she did come back to assist after her retirement, and when students were actually on campus, Nancy would remember them and about their families as if they had seen her a month before and not years before. When she was here, she asked a couple of times, do you know whatever happened to a NAMA student, a graduate? And she would be pleased to know their journey. Most of all though, care and compassion for her family. Raymond, her partner in life for decades, and Adienne and Eric, their beloved children, and the dogs, of course, the dogs. She was so proud, and is so proud, I know, to share information on their successes and journeys throughout their lives. Some fun, some challenging, but always supportive and proud of them. Nancy, you have been missed, but I know you will always be a friend and an associate to AST. Thank you. President Bennett, I am pleased to announce the names of the following persons who have completed the requirements of the Diploma in the New Evangelization and whose academic achievements have been confirmed by the Senate of Atlantic School of Theology. In the class of 2020, Martha Oriana Carrera, Nanette Kroll, Graziella Gerbitz, Karen LeBlanc, James Melanson, Catherine Petrie, and Debbie Power. And in the class of 2021, Mark Carew, Shannon McDonald, Katie Andrews, Roberta Courtney, Elizabeth Galsworthy, Andrew Hashi, Bruce Muse, and Donna Reindorf. On behalf of Atlantic School of Theology, I hereby confer upon you 
the Diploma in the New Evangelization. I am pleased also to announce the names of the following persons who have completed the requirements of the Diploma in Theological Studies and whose academic achievements have been confirmed by the Senate of Atlantic School of Theology. In the class of 2020, Sharon Arbo, Joanne Chapman, Trudy Kolpitz, Pamela Larive, Ashley Slonwhite, and Don Upham. And in the class of 2021, Mary Banks, David Bork, Angela Renee Daw, Daryl James, and Rosalind McDonald. On behalf of Atlantic School of Theology, I hereby confer upon you the Diploma in Theological Studies. I am pleased to announce the names of the following persons who have completed all requirements of the Graduate Certificate in Theological Studies. In the class of 2020, Dr. Philip Cooper, Karen Manuel, Julian Jebediah Summers, and in the class of 2021, Marie-Claude Chasson. On behalf of Atlantic School of Theology, I hereby confer upon you the Graduate Certificate in Theological Studies. I am pleased to announce the names of the following persons who have completed all requirements of the degree of Master of Arts, Theology and Religious Studies, and whose academic achievements have been confirmed by the Senate of Atlantic School of Theology. In the class of 2020, April Elizabeth Hart and Kathy Target. In the class of 2021, Keith Gale, Dr. Haider Al Hussein, and Nicole Snook. By the authority vested in me by the Board and Senate of Atlantic School of Theology, I admit you to the degree of Master of Arts, Theology and Religious Studies, with all the rights, honors, and privileges pertaining thereto. I am pleased to announce the names of the following persons who have completed all requirements of the degree of Master of Divinity and whose academic achievements have been confirmed by the Senate of Atlantic School of Theology. In the class of 2020, Douglas Beck, Shirley Cole, Rebecca Duncan, Gail Fricker, Rick Gunn, April Elizabeth Hart, Jan McCormick, Allison McCoolan, Amadeus Perales, Julian Jebediah Summers, Joyce Van Eyck, and Gavin Williams. And in the class of 2021, Andrew Gilliland, Matthew Heesing, Arla Johnson, Susan McElveen, Cynthia O'Connell, and Emma Kathleen Simon. By the authority vested in me, by the Board and Senate of Atlantic School of Theology, I admit you to the degree of Master of Divinity with all the rights, honors, and privileges pertaining thereto. And finally, I am pleased to announce that the Senate of Atlantic School of Theology has named Dr. David Suzuki as the 2021 recipient of the degree of Doctor of Divinity honoris causa. By the authority vested in me by the Board and Senate of Atlantic School of Theology, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Divinity honoris causa with all the rights, honors, and privileges pertaining thereto. Mr. President, 2020 and 2021 graduates, 
AST faculty and staff, guests, I have the honor to introduce the recipient of the Honorary Doctor of Divinity, Honoris Causa, Dr. David Suzuki, an environmental activist for almost four decades, who in his mid-80s continues as a passionate advocate for radical climate action. Dr. Suzuki was born in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1936. In 1941, along with other Japanese Canadians, his family was deprived of citizenship rights and deported to a camp in the BC interior. Bullied by other children, he spent hours alone in the forest, unafraid of the wildlife he encountered, developing what became a lifelong love of nature. Since this early experience of racism, a commitment to equity and social justice has marked his environmental activism, most recently in his advocacy for a just and re green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Educated at Amherst College and the University of Chicago, Dr. Suzuki returned to Canada to serve as professor in the genetics department at the University of British Columbia from 1936 to 2001. And at his retirement was awarded the title of Professor Emeritus. As the host of the CBC Science and Natural History television series, the nature of things, and the original host of CBC's ra CBC Radio's Quirks and Quarks, as well as the acclaimed series, It's a Matter of Survival, and From Naked Ape to Super Species, Dr. Suzuki became an international celebrity. In 1990, Dr. Suzuki co-founded with his wife, Dr. Tara Kallis, the David Suzuki Foundation, a collaborative, solutions-focused approach to conserving our environment, to create a sustainable Canada through science-based research, education, and policy work. Companion to the Order of Canada, Dr. Suzuki has received many other distinguished awards for his work, including Ionesco's Kalinga Prize for Science, the United Nations Environment Program Medal, the 2012 Inamori Ethics Prize, the 2009 Right Livelihood Award, and UNEP's Global 500. Dr. Suzuki has been granted 29 honorary degrees from universities around the world, published more than 55 books, and has been featured in documentary films, including Force of Nature, the David Suzuki movie. Dr. Suzuki's unsparing criticism of politicians and corporate polluters of the environment has gained him a reputation as a stinging gadfly, willing to risk the ire of others by standing up for what matters. He lives his life according to a motto learned from his father. You are what you do, not what you say. In his environmental activism, doing often involves speech. Dr. Suzuki urges the necessity of a fundamental shift from a profit-driven economic worldview. He says, we need to remember that we are animals and therefore utterly dependent 
upon the biosphere. At our peril, we ignore that we live in a world created and constrained by laws of nature, physics, chemistry, biology, laws that, repli that apply regardless. Our economy risks gutting the necessary elements of human life. Humans have exceeded the biological carrying capacity of our ecosystems. Based on his prophetic reading of the signs of the times, Dr. Suzuki asks hard questions. Will we survive? another 20 years? How do humans shift course after becoming the major force altering the chemical, physical, and biological properties of the planet? Where in our society is there a place for the sacred? What kind of species are we if we don't care enough about our children to act in response to the climate emergency? When does the fantasy that it's possible to have continuous economic growth submit to the reality of a finite world? Despite the bleak picture, Dr. Suzuki remains a searcher for solutions. As Jane Fonda says to him in a podcast interview, you carry a lot of joy and humor. While other scientists argue that it is too late for climate action, Dr. Suzuki actively looks for sources of hope. While admitting that it's very, very late and urgent, he's unwilling to give up the fight. We still have a 5% chance to act and to keep the temperature increase within 2 degrees Celsius. Even if we fail, we have to try, he says, and we don't know enough to make pronouncements. While not all the surprises are good, nature can surprise us and is far more generous than we deserve. He has lived for 45 years in the same house, urging the need to stay in place and fight for that place, motivated by the law of love, which is as foundational and as universal as any other physical law. It is written everywhere we look, and it maps our intimate connection with the rest of the living world. While uninterested in what people may say about him after his death, Dr. Suzuki would consider it a crowning achievement if he can say to his grandchildren before his death, well, I'm just one person, but I did the best I could for you. I tried. It is my great honor to present to you the AST 2021 recipient of the degree of Doctor of Divinity, honoris causa, Dr. David Suzuki, a true citizen of the earth, 
who will not give up the fight for a sustainable Canada and to re-green the planet. I'm speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Wiwaikai Nation on Quadra Island in British Columbia, who cared for these lands and waters for thousands of years. I'm delighted and honored to receive this degree from the Atlantic School of Theology. It's especially appropriate because I believe the environmental crisis we face demands a recognition of our need for spirit, an acknowledgement of the sacred. Congratulations to all members of the graduating class. I'm delighted to join you. As you all know, a teenager, Greta Thunberg, has galvanized young people around the world to rally around the issue of climate change. She has had a huge impact because she speaks an unassailable truth that the future for her and all generations to come is in peril. You see, we are at an unprecedented moment that has occurred with explosive speed through the conjunction of population growth, technological innovation, consumptive demand, and a global economy. This is the Anthropocene Epoch, a time when we have become the major force altering the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. The problem is that we know so little about how nature works to keep the planet habitable for us that we end up undermining the life support systems of Earth, the air, water, soil, photosynthesis, and biodiversity. How did we get to this point? Science informs us that we evolved as a species on the great grasslands of Africa 150,000 years ago, where compared to all the other animals around us, we were not very impressive. We weren't very big, fast, strong, or gifted in acuity of our senses, but we did have one great advantage over all the others, a kilogram and a half organ buried deep in our skulls. The human brain was curious, observant, inventive, learned from experience and trial and error, and it had a massive memory so that what was learned could be passed on from generation to generation. Drawing on experience, that brain invented a concept called the future and realized we could affect the future by what we do in the present. Look ahead, see where dangers lie and where opportunities were, and deliberately choose to avoid hazards and exploit opportunity. It began simply enough, like walking along a trail and coming to a fork and thinking, hmm, I went off to the right a few weeks ago and I ran into a saber-toothed tiger. But I, I know that on the left, there are some good berries to eat. I'm going left. Foresight was our great survival advantage. Today, we have created a spasm of ex extinction that has already eliminated much of the mass of plants and animals around the earth and continues to threaten the imminent extinction of a million species more. We are one species among millions, yet we have taken over most of the land mass and have created a mess of the oceans that cover 70% of the earth. So now, scientists armed with supercomputers Tell us with foresight, we have very little time to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change and species extinction. Yet now, we are turning our backs on the great survival tactic of our species. Look ahead, avoid the dangers and exploit opportunities. Why? For most of human history, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers, carrying everything we owned as we followed plants and animals through the seasons and on their migrations. Living that way, we have always known we live within a web of relationships with all other species of plants and animals and with air, water, soil, and sunlight. This is an ecocentric 
perspective. We see that we're just a small part of this complex web. Over the past millennium, we have moved out of an ecocentric worldview to an anthropocentric one in which we are at the top and everything is about us. A belief that we are special, made in the image of God to exploit the rest of creation. The Renaissance brought Francis Bacon, René Descartes, Isaac Newton, who put the focus on the mind as the essence of who we are and we're so smart, while the Industrial Revolution that followed gave the sense that we had escaped through our intellect the limits of nature, including the limits of our own biology. Telescopes enabled us to see to the edge of the universe. Microscopes reveal a world of life in a drop of water. Machines work tirelessly around the clock, do repetitive work accurately and lift and move enormous weights. Vehicles can travel faster than the speed of sound. We can fly, dive beneath the ocean, escape gravity and live in space. We've invented computers that think at the speed of light. There seems to be no limit to humanity except our imagination and productivity. So the institutions that we have constructed to guide and manage human behavior, religious, legal, economic, political, reflect our anthropocentrism and thus are constructed in a way that ensures nature, the source of our lives and well-being, is subordinate to us and thus inevitably will lose out. Mark Carney illustrates in his book Values with Amazon. Amazon, the company, is worth hundreds of billions, while Amazon, the rainforest, has no value until it is destroyed and made over by dams, farming, ranches, or cities. This is insane! The Amazon rainforest is priceless, a creation of nature that will never be replaced, while the company is just a human creation. It will change and maybe disappear in a few decades. For over 40 years, I have worked with and learned from indigenous people. They have clung to an ecocentric perspective that is embodied in the land, their culture, and language. As the Brundtland Report in 1987 pointed out, they are the only groups in the world with a track record of living sustainably in place for thousands of years. No company or government can make that claim for even a decade or two. In fighting for their territory, indigenous people are not only struggling for the source of their future, They are desperate to act properly and care for it because that is their sacred responsibility. Ganesatagi Mohawks near Montreal fought for the Oka Pine Forest, a small piece of land that is not crucial for their economic interests. But the Mohawks are desperate to care for it properly, and that means no golf course and no condominiums. When indigenous people practice ceremony, their songs, their dances and prayers, they thank their creator for nature's abundance and generosity and promise to act properly to protect that web. They do not have all the solutions to our environmental crisis in 2021. I mean, for example, before contact with Europeans, Haida took months to cut down one of their great cedar trees. They would burn and then chip away with stone axes, burn and chip. But today, one man and a chainsaw can do it in minutes. The planet has changed enormously since indigenous people lived on it. But it is their perspective, the way they see our relationship with Mother Earth, that we can learn from and through which we must act. Indigenous people think about their actions across a time scale of seven generations. 
which is critical and so fundamentally different from corporate bottom lines of quarterly reports and political priorities dictated by when is the next election. Indigenous elders are held in highest esteem as keepers of knowledge, history, culture, and experience, while we in the dominant society have seen them bear the vast majority of COVID deaths across Canada because they're seen as no longer important contributors to the economy. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, and the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, the TRC, provide a pathway to righting injustices of the past and a way to reinsert ourselves back into a web of relationships. This is the moment, and this is a challenge of our times, which we all have no choice but to be engaged in. Thank you for this honor, Thank you for the opportunity to share a few ideas with you.
in May of 2020, those of us graduating well knew that we were entering the world offering leadership and service. After all, we have been formed by AST's tradition of cooperation and respect. What we did not know then was that the disruptions of last spring would linger and that we would be here one year later, still not able to be together in person. As leaders at this time, we find ourselves navigating new territory. With large toolboxes for ministry, we calmly, steadily keep the holding environment of faith, hope, and love for those whom we serve. During this unprecedented time of change, we hold the realities of isolation, depression, loneliness, grief, and death. We hold these up to the bedrock of faith, hope, and love. After all, we are still God's beloved children. We still get to live fully into the human experience that, yes, does include sadness, loss, and the important work of grief. We still inhabit a beautiful but broken world where we get to serve the world's peoples. We possess many gifts for this. Our bodies, for one, carry within them the tremendous capacity to heal and to forgive when we allow ourselves to live in the truth of this gift. Human connection and touch continue to be necessary ground for our health and our well-being. Think of all the creative ways that we engage to meet the needs of the others whom we serve at this time, and nothing keeps us from respecting the dignity of every life. We can still regard the autonomy of each life. This being so, we may focus our care and steer others toward enjoying a reasonable happiness. The cycle of life continues all around us with the sun that still rises and sets, the joy of hearing birds singing, the emergence of new green shoots of life emerging from the slowly thawing earth. Here we are, serving Christ's mission at this time, this time that God calls us to. We do so thankful that we have been shaped effectively and faithfully as ordained and lay leaders, now shaping understanding among the communities of faith in the places that we serve. Being a professional preacher, pastor, and minister for about the last five years or so, I, like many of you, have done a lot of public speaking. Week in and week out, I've planned a message. Some weeks it's been very easy, other weeks very hard. Overall, I've spoken about 200 times in a public speaking event. Many of you would be similar. We have a ton of sermon writing experience, but a speech is very different from a sermon. Most speeches begin with thank yous to the people who got the speaker to the place they are, while most sermons begin with prayer. With that in mind, I'd like to thank all of you as my, those classmates graduating beside me for all of your support, all of your help, all of our friendships we have built. I would not be sharing these words if it were not for all of you. I'd also like to thank all of our teachers and staff at AST for all of their help and dedication as we've journeyed along together with them. For those of us in the United Church of Canada, a special thank you to Pine Hill for all of their support over the years. To our respective partners and families and friends, thank you to you as well. Last but definitely not least, a good speech would not be complete without thanking God for all the many memories and friendships that we have made and all the things we've learned, not only about ourselves, but about life and faith in the Bible as well. I was told I have about three minutes for this speech, but when a professor gives us a word limit, there's always a bit of flexibility. One professor told us, 10% more or less, and they would be happy. We can't be together to celebrate this great occasion like we'd prefer, but to truly honor what most of us stand for, I thought I'd record this speech in different locations, like a church, because most of us are currently in or will be in ministry. 
AST is of course a beautiful campus and a beautiful city on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Since we cannot be at the ocean together though, I thought I'd bring you to what is probably the next best thing, the shores of Lake Erie. The northern shores of Lake Erie to be exact. We've all made wonderful memories during our time at AST. Some happy times, some sad times. Summer months were especially significant because of all the time we spent together, but also the time we spent away from our family and friends and loved ones in a lot of cases. No matter how busy we were studying or writing papers, we always found time to spend together those summer months. Whether it was chapel each morning, sitting around the dinner table eating food, enjoying snacks and beverages on Wine Wednesdays, enjoying a Friday night dinner together out in the town, or a Saturday evening barbecue on the front lawn of AST. We always spent time together. All of us have made a lot of memories during our time at AST, a lot of friendships as well. And I know I will always look back at my time at AST much like you and see how much I have grown and changed over these last five years. A good sermon is focused on God, the Bible, and faith. A good speech is focused on the things we have done and accomplished to get us to this day and those that have helped us. Celebrate yourselves today in whatever way you see fit. If you have a drink nearby, cheers to you. A good speech could be like a good sermon in one way, though. It ends with something significant. And what's more significant for most of us than the Bible? Especially the NRSV version. Say Isaiah 58 verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually. Or Joshua 1 verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid for your Lord, your God will guide you wherever you go. And if neither of those speak to you, I have one more for you. A paraphrase from Ephesians 3.20. God has more in store for you than you can ever imagine. And if you do not know the difference between a translation and a paraphrase, get yourself a degree from AST, and that is one of the many things you could learn. Cheers. Let me begin with heartfelt congratulations to the class of 2020 and the class of 2021, whose graduation from Atlantic School of Theology we are celebrating. You have overcome so much to achieve the academic accomplishments we are recognizing and affirming today. You have risen to the demands of graduate level theological education and the trials of a global pandemic with grace and resilience. Well done, my friends, and congratulations. I also want to say how grateful we are for the gifts that you have brought to the AST community. The gifts of learning, of leadership, of fellowship. Thank you for all you mean to this community. A few months ago in a video meeting, where else? I was asked what theology has to say about the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm sorry to say I fumbled my answer a bit. I'm embarrassed because I think the answer is actually clear and obvious and central to the Christian faith. COVID-19, a new and novel virus, has offered us a lesson for the ages. That lesson is this. There is nothing more important than loving relationships. Christians believe in a God who is love, whose being is entirely relational. Each one of us, every family and community, every nation and people, every living being, indeed all of creation, we are all connected. And it is the quality of that connection that determines everything. Lives are made and destroyed by it. Nations rise and fall because of it. History is changed by it. Species and ecosystems thrive or, extingu or are extinguished because of it. The very future of our planet depends on it. Think of the past year when our very connection with one another, even our physical nearness, nearness has brought mortal risk. Despite that risk, 
Especially, in fact, in face of that risk, we have reached out to each other in creative ways for closeness, for comfort, for connection. It has taken the action of a life-denying pandemic to generate the equal and opposite reaction of life-giving, loving relationship. I will always remember the precise moment, the place, the time, the surroundings, when at last I could again put my arms around my son after months of anxious separation and lockdown. And COVID-19 has brought urgency to new and ongoing calls for justice. When we call for justice, we call for loving relationship to be reflected and built in to our institutions and systems. When we assert that black lives matter, we assert that our police forces must enter into loving relationship with those they are sworn to serve and protect, but who all too often they oppress with racial, racialized violence. When we hear Me Too, we hear a naming of the poisonous abuse of power, a demand for the rejection of toxic masculinity, a call for loving relationship. When we stand up for justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and children, we stand up for their right to be seen, to be known, to be valued in a community of loving relationship. When we witness the assertion of voting rights and an affirmation of democracy, we witness a desire for government that reflects loving relationship when we confront homophobia and transphobia and prejudice of all kinds, we confront them for the sake of loving relationship. When we clamor for economic justice and for the world's wealth and income to be shared more fairly, we are motivated by loving relationship. And of course, none of this would be possible None of this will be possible. Life itself will not be possible, absent a loving relationship with our planet. If the pandemic has been a kind of, a kind of crucifixion, a prolonged period of suffering and separation, anguish, death, and grieving, then out of it the world is experiencing a kind of resurrection. There is growing awareness that how we treat each other and the planet must transcend all other considerations. Now you may be thinking that I am wearing rose colored glasses. Well, the thing about a resurrection is that it requires true believers. Those who are suffused with hope, ready to recognize the presence of love and to make it real to others. This resurrection is a delicate thing. It must be given strength, particularly by those for whom loving relationship is a matter of faith and calling. Graduates, you will lead the way. This is your calling. You are well prepared for it, and you will be upheld and sustained in your work. Thank you for the time and the energy and the effort and the study and prayer you have put into becoming the faithful and effective leaders you are. Thank you for all that you have done and will do to help right the wrongs of this world that God so loves. Let me now, on behalf of the whole AST community, extend our sincere thanks and congratulations to Nancy LeBlanc, Anthony Mancini, and David Suzuki. You honor us in allowing us to honor you. I would also like to express our gratitude to all of those students, staff, faculty, so many people 
who have done so much to make today's convocation so meaningful, even as a virtual ceremony. Following the final hymn, the Reverend Dr. Susan Wilhock will close convocation in prayer. Dr. Wilhock has been a member of Atlantic School of Theology faculty since 2009 and will be retiring at the end of this academic year. She has educated and mentored and supported and encouraged endless, countless numbers of students. Out of deep knowledge and skill, with heart, passion, and grace. Thank you so much, Susan, for your outstanding contribution to AST. to the close of this virtual but nonetheless auspicious ceremony. Graduates, this is your day and you have permission to bask a bit in its glory. Degrees have been conferred and congratulations have been bestowed, but it does not end here. This, in fact, is the initiation to a new turn in your path. Leaving something behind can bring its own grief, but turning to face something new is bold and daring and emergent. I've often said, and it's true, that I count it as my greatest honor to have sojourned here with you, to have walked a little way with each of you on your pilgrimage of learning. I will remember you. Keep going and keep to the high ground with the wind of the Spirit at your back. May your voices rise up to pronounce peace and justice in the world. And may the fanfare of your achievements here spur you on toward leading your communities to live lives worthy of the gospel. Yes, there are a good many things to distract us from that lofty goal. There are things that could give us stony and stubborn hearts, 
But remember, in the Book of Common Prayer, there is a benediction from Peter's testimony in the second chapter of Acts that echoes the prophet Ezekiel. It asks God to send us into the world in peace, to grant us strength and courage, to love and serve with gladness and singleness of heart. It is that joy, that generosity of spirit, that singular and focused orientation of the heart that I leave with you today. May the God of love bless you and keep you. May the tenderness of the Son and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul and fire to your steps this day and all the days to come. Amen. Amen.